Hello everyone, friends, subscribers, members, and viewers alike. As many newcomers have joined this channel recently, I felt it was important to re-upload a live stream from March of 2023, where I shared the heartbreaking story of my best friend Tony Cardoza's murder. Recounting this chapter was incredibly tough for me, but it reinforced my purpose today, advocating, seeking truth, and speaking up. Back then, my channel had a different name and a different look as I was still discovering my path on YouTube. I want to assure you that I've grown significantly since then, thanks in a large part of all of you, my subscribers, viewers, members, and talented individuals who have contributed to this channel. Without each of you, this platform wouldn't be the incredible outlet it has become for discussing and exploring the cases that we cover. Thank you all for taking the time to watch this replay, and this is Tony's story. Back in school, on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Welcome back to the Opinionated YouTube, Opinionated Idiot YouTube channel. Gee, I just stumbled on my name there. I just stumbled on my name. I think what it is is when I get ready for showtime, I get like major anxiety that I'm going live on air and uh, kind of just all hit to. Some nights I get like that. Some nights I don't. Tonight is particularly a very uh, stressful, I guess, nervous evening but we must go on with the show so it's march 5th 2023 sunday evening here in the northeast and i want to welcome everybody back to the live show so what we're going to do this evening and i'll be honest with you i've tried to kind of run through my head how i'm going to do this program this evening because um a lot of what i've you know gone through during this particular time back in 1994, up until now, a lot of the, the memories have kind of been suppressed. And uh, I, I actually have some notes in front of me, kind of a timeline. So I'm going to read through the timeline um, of particularly what happened to me. Um, this is a, a tribute show to my friend, Tony Cardozo. Uh, that was murdered back in 1994, actually Super Bowl Sunday, January 20th, uh, January 30th, uh, 1994. And uh, I'm going to tell you his story. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to open the show this evening, kind of a, I don't know, I just felt like a, a statement or something that I could do or say to anybody that's been through anything like this or going through anything like this. So let me read through that and then I'm going to I'm going to pull up the chats. I see you guys chatting, but let me just get through this first and um I just feel like this is really the proper way to kind of start the show. Uh let me grab my screen here and um we'll look at the chats after. So I kind of wrote some notes here. And um, what I came up with, and I hope you guys can see it. Let me try to enlarge it a little bit more here. So losing a friend to murder is an extremely tra traumatic and painful experience. The sudden 
the sudden and violent loss of someone close to you can leave you feeling overwhelmed with a range of emotions, including anger, sadness, confusion, and disbelief. Coping with the death of a friend is never easy, and dealing with it in the aftermath of murder can always especially be difficult. In this, in this article, or in my statement, we will discuss some practical steps that you can take to deal with the loss of a friend to murder. So you want to allow yourself to grieve. The loss of a friend is significant loss, and it's important to allow yourself to grieve. It's common to feel a range of emotions, including anger, sadness, and disbelief. It's important to acknowledge these feelings and allow yourself to feel them. Don't try to suppress your emotions or pretend that you're okay uh, if you're not. Allow yourself to grieve in a way, whether it's through talking to someone, writing a journal, or engaging in activities, what brings you comfort. Seek support. During this difficult time, it's important to seek support from family members, friends, or a therapist. Talking to someone about your feelings and emotion can help you process your grief and provide you support and comfort you need. If you have any trouble coping, a mental health professional can help you work through your emotions and develop coping strategies. You need to take care of yourself. It's easy to neglect your own needs when you're grieving, but it's important to take care of yourself during this time. Make sure you're getting enough rest, eating a healthy diet, engaging in activities that bring you joy. Exercise can also be an excellent way to manage stress and help you feel better. You need to find ways to honor your friend. Find ways to honor your friend's memory can help you process the grief and keep these memories alive. This could be through creating a memorial, uh, a, mor a memorial or tribute, participating in a charity event in their honor, or simply sharing stories and memories of your friends with others. It can also be helpful to talk to your friends and what they meant to you and the others uh, who, knew him, who knew them. Take your time. Grieving is a process and it takes time. There's no right way to grieve. And everybody's process their emotions differently. Allow yourself to take time. You need to grieve and heal. Don't rush the process or try to push yourself to feel better. You're not ready. Losing a friend to murder is an incredibly difficult experience. But with support, self-care, and time, you can walk through your emotions and find ways to honor your friend's memory. Remember to be kind to yourself. Seek help when you need it. And take things one day at a time. So something I just kind of jotted down today and um, I just kind of want to, I, I guess, I don't know, felt like it. I needed to read a, a statement or something before we kind of start this show. Um, let me just pull up some of the chats here real quick. Kelly's in the chat. She says, hello, how are you, Kelly? Dylan Taylor looks like a new name, and Kelly looks like a new name over here as well. I just want to welcome them. Dr. Pob is in the house. So what I did was I took, I dug out a lot of newspaper articles because that's the way we got our information back in the 90s because there was no internet. <laughs> it's just nothing like this. So I spent a little time up at staples and scanned in a bunch of newspapers articles that we're going to pull up here in a little bit and uh you know we didn't take a lot of photos back in in 91 you know this is a polaroid this is what we had to take photos and uh i i actually scanned this as well and i'll be able to pull this up so we can see a little bit more detail and uh i don't know i guess i'll just begin of i, I was i don't know i've i've practiced kind of practice over the week i've talk to friends about it. I don't know how this is all going to come out, but we're going to try. Um, so in 1991, uh, I was 13 years old. Um, I met uh, my friend Tony and uh, a little background on him. Uh, he was from East Providence, Rhode Island. And that time in the 90s, it was pretty rough. I mean, I, all major cities have, you know, their issues. Um, you know, but the, the crime rates, particularly back in the nineties, from my, from what my memory was really bad, uh, especially where I am so close to the border of Rhode Island, you know, a lot of things have changed, uh, crime has gone down, but particularly in that time in the nineties, it was really bad. I mean, it was pretty common occurrence. If you heard of a, a murder or a stabbing or, or 
you know, a crime, a burglary, a robbery. Uh, it was pretty common in and around those areas at the time. <clears throat> uh, a lot of drugs, uh, marijuana, cocaine, crack. Um, heroin wasn't really, you know, it was more the, the I guess, the tr cheap drugs you could get on the streets back then, if you want to call that cheap. Um, so it came from an area of East Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, from what I remember, his mother met a very wealthy uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, and that's where I live. I live very particularly close to the um, East Providence border. Uh, Rhode Island border, I'm sorry. So um, they eventually got out of uh, Rhode Island, out of the Providence area, and more into the suburbs of Massachusetts, you know, a much, I guess, nicer area, if you would say that at that time. Um, and I lived in a uh, apartment complex building where there's a lot of, you know, particular apartments, you know, single family, uh, you know, single people or small, you know, three families, uh, you know, husband, wife, child type of buildings. And uh, we had kind of a common play area in the back. It was just a grassy area. There was a little bit of a berm. And, and up on that berm was a row of, you know, uh, small pine trees, I, I guess you would call it, or shrubs. And over in that next yard was this huge mansion house, this big house, you know, something that looked like it built maybe at the turn, you know, at the 1900s or 1920 or something beautiful gorgeous aesthetically house uh gentlemen obviously that lived there had a lot of money the family that lived there had a lot of money and um i remember <clears throat> i remember seeing this kid out there washing cars all the time i would always look over and you know i'd be in the backyard and I'd see him and naturally after a while kids kind of start to talk and uh we kind of started talking through the bushes and we made very, you know, fast friends, if, if you would say that. And um, what I can say about Tony was he had uh, incredible charisma right away. Uh, he had the type of charisma that you either liked him right away or you hated him right away. <laughs> And he was just that particular person. And I don't know what happened, but our energy just kind of came together and we came really brothers really quick. And from what I remember, um, he had a very rough patch through like middle school, uh, was in kind of like adjustment programs, you know, kind of an attitude type of kid. I mean, you gotta think this is 91. This is, you know, the height of, you know, MTV is just starting to blow out. We're seeing, you know, uh, gangster rap for the first time, you know, we're following NWA. We're dressing like NWA. Um, let me pull up this photo just so I can kind of break up some of the conversation really quick. Let me see. Oh, what I do? I screwed my screen up. Hang on guys. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is us in 91. So here's me, little 13 years old, off to the left. I'm not going to disclose the gentleman's name in the middle, but my friend Tony is in white and this female here, I don't know who scratched out the picture. It could have been an ex-girlfriend or something of one of the guys, but, um, you know, we didn't, you didn't take a lot of pictures back then. Here I am. Look at this. It's all Raiders gear. And, you know, we're, we're wearing our hammer pants and it's funny, you know, it's funny, but here I was, you know, these, these older kids, you know, I'm hanging out 13 years old and, uh, I have a few more photos of them somewhere, some solo ones, but this is really the only one I could find. Look at me, <laughs> us together. So, um, like I said, he, uh, had some issues in, in, in school was in some kind of adjustment programs. And I think, you know, it was good for him and his mom to get out of that area to kind of get him straightened out and, and, uh, you know, not running with these rough kids and, you know, so be it. So, um, like I said, we made fast friends. 
uh, I started introducing him to a lot of the the girls in the building that we lived in. He made, you know, uh, the quickest friends with the ladies and the the even faster enemies with the guys that were trying to chase those girls. Um, and uh, I would say probably in about you know we we were tight. Ninety one, we were really really tight. Staying each, you know at his house and hanging out like kids did back then. Uh, he was very very very, very, very overprotective of me. And I always felt the reason he was like that after all these years and thinking about it was, um, one, I was probably the, you know, the brother, the, the little brother he never had, or maybe I was just that kind of purity thing in his life that kept him away from trouble. Cause I wasn't really a trouble kid and yeah, an attitude. And you did your little petty stuff as a kid, but, um, uh, you know, it, I wasn't doing the things that he was doing or involved in. So I'd say probably it, it about maybe early 1992 ish, about a year after we met, he started kind of sneaking back to East Providence and kind of hanging back with the, the kids that he was getting in trouble with. And particularly the gentleman that was in the center of the photo. I'm just gonna get a sip of water here. Sorry, guys. Um, particularly the gentleman that I showed you in the middle of the the, the photo, and uh, he was trouble. And in that neighborhood, there was some really rough kids, and uh, those particular groups of kids kind of went at each other all the time, and they were chasing each other around and beating the shit out of each other. And um, I kind of started to see that come around and I kind of my spidey sense went up and you know they were driving around in stolen cars and just stuff you don't want to be involved in or be around so my my spidey sense kind of went off and I said you know I'm gonna start probably pulling myself out of this hanging out with these kids so in about you know 92 ends 93 the early of uh 93 he kind of runs away from home and starts getting himself kind of more in trouble because he's gone back to Providence at this point. Um, doesn't come, you know, doesn't come back home. Uh, I start not really seeing him anymore, you know, maybe here and there. Um, so there's about 93. And I basically separated myself from the situation. And that time I started to uh, lose contact with him. Here and there, we would pop up. He'd, I had eventually moved out of the area across town, um, but he would always kind of find his way back around and, and find me in some way. Um, so after all that happens, his mom ends up coming home one day, finding her husband, the gentleman that she was married, married to, in bed with another woman. So that ends up breaking that relationship. And she ends up moving into these apartments called the Meadows. By this time, um, Tony's really running with some really rough kids. Uh, been arrested a few times. The drugs start kind of coming into it. And the strange thing about it is when we were hanging out for like that three years, pretty solid. I never saw any drugs. You know, nothing past like pot. I didn't see cocaine or anything like that we were you know drinking and sneaking liquor from the you know the parents liquor cabinet and shit like that but i never saw hard drugs you know pot maybe every once in a while something like that um so 1994 comp uh 1994 is 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 just turning um and about a week before the Super Bowl, Super Bowl was uh, January 30th, 1994. Tony, I hadn't seen him in probably a couple months, maybe three to six months. He kind of pops up one day as I'm getting off the bus to school and, hey, what's up? And, you know, how are you? And uh, I'm trying to straighten everything out. I just got out of rehab and I'm going to be going back to live with my mother, or, you know, across town. And I want to, you know, just I... I think I remember that he might have had a baby on the way. I I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Um, 
but anyway, he says, well, you should come over for the Super Bowl. Come hang out. I'm back home. I'm getting, you know, I'm straightening up. I'm cut all the kids that I was hanging out with. I'm not getting in trouble anymore. I said, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Give me a number. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, we get to the Saturday before the Sunday Super Bowl. And my grandfather ends up getting ill and a call comes to my mom. So that Saturday we leave, go up to Boston. We spend the whole day in Boston, Sunday with him. I don't end eventually end up going over to see Tony, um, which essentially saved my life because my grandfather being sick essentially saved my life because on Super Bowl Sunday, my friend was murdered. Um, the thing that I always go over in my head now is the thing that was very unclear to me, the two gentlemen that, well, the one that was convicted of murder, and we're going to pull up the, the articles here in a minute, the one that was convicted of murder, um, and then the other gentleman that was with him, and I don't know why I'm calling them gentlemen, I'm just guys, I guess boys or whatever, um, I wasn't sure if they were supposed to be there or they showed up. And that was never really made clear. Um, so before I get the articles here, uh, you know, things that I just remember, um, you know, going to the funeral, going to the wake, um, it was crazy and, you know, a lot of people there. And I remember his mom pulling me aside and saying, and I, and I quote, quote from her, because I can remember, she said, use this, use this experience as, an, you know, tears in her eyes, bawling, use this as, use this as an example and don't turn out like Tony. And something just kind of clicked with me. And from there on out, you know, I just made a, 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 a pat, I guess, to her and myself to say, if I ever come across kids that are in trouble like this, uh, I'm just not going to roll with people like this to keep myself out of trouble. And, and it was just tragic because deep down inside, he was a very good kid. And that's one thing that everybody said about him. He was a good kid and he was so charismatic. Um, and he was just the type, he was just so overprotective of me. And I just remember times like when kids picked on me, he's like, all right, fucking go down there, show me who he is. Oh yeah, it's him right there. And he just fucking deck him and knock the kid out for me. Uh, that's just the type of relationship we had. And uh, he was funny. He was just a witty kid and a great kid. And uh, I miss him to death. And like I said, I've, I've suppressed a lot of these, you know, feelings and emotions, but I don't know, something just, I, I think just coming back into the, the material that we're doing now, it kind of sparked this back up and maybe it's good for me to talk about it because I know I've suppressed a lot of these emotions over the years. Um, but he was such a great kid. And, and, and for that particular moment in my life, I believe that because I was such a skinny, scrawny kid and a lot of people picked on me, he was my protector. And if there is a God or if there is some avenging angel that looks over us, he was sent here to protect me for those couple of years. And I am ever so grateful for that. Um, I miss him. I do. And um, I would have loved to see how his life would have turned out. Do I think he would have went through an extremely rough patch in life? Probably. Um, but it would be nice to have him sitting here today and we're doing this together, this podcast, you know, this, this YouTube stuff, but I miss him a lot. Let me, um, let me pull up these, uh, these articles. And this is, this is how we got information back then. So, um, I remember getting the call. And this was really the first bit of information that we got. Um, I redacted a lot of the names and information on here. Um, I'm not going to read through a lot of it because I, I don't want to, you know, we can, we can go through some of this together. But so the first um, one that was in uh, our local paper was teen uh, murdered 
in North. Um, whew, sorry, guys. Um, a 17-year-old uh, local youth was stabbed to death at the Meadows Apartments uh, apartment complex on Route 1 at about 8.45 Sunday night. Uh, no arrests were made. Police said, and there were no suspects. The victim identified as Antonio Cardozo of 314 River Street suffered multiple stab wounds to the head and body. He was pronounced dead at Sturdy Memorial Hospital in Attleboro about an hour after the assault. Police said that Cardozo ran out of the apartment about 300 feet to another building in the complex yelling for help. A trail of blood led to the crime scene at 21 Lakeshore Drive to Building A at 17 Lakeshore Drive, where the victim was found by residents, police said. North Attleboro Police Chief John D. Coyle said, uh, Jr. said, today the police found evidence that the victim had drugs in the apartment. And this is why I said that I never saw really any hard drugs. And uh, there was cocaine involved in this. I don't know the level of that. Um, I haven't. I don't think I've just ever really gone down that path. I think I might have heard some stuff back in the day, but it was never really truly explained. No weapons were found on Sunday night. Coyle said the police were continuing to research, uh, to search the, the area today. The Meadows Apartments complex is located here um, next to Falls Pond. There's several buildings. Coyle said Cardozo was at the mother, his mother's apartment, Unit E, where he was stabbed. His mother, Ogla, was not at home at the time, police said. The police chief said victim lived with his stepfather, Leo Chouanier, on River Street, but also stayed sometime at his mother's. Detective uh, Gould and Sergeant Dawes are investigating uh, with the state troopers from the district attorney's office. Let me pull some of the chats up real quick. Supernaturals here said, West Coast Canada in the house. Thank you. Teresa says, wow. And Lee is in the house. Hello, Lee. Thank you so much for the hugs. I appreciate that. Um, so we had the first article that was out. And then um, that Tuesday, they had suspects. Teens held in murder. Cocaine led to a fatal fight, North Attleboro police say. Suspects leaving the station. Uh, blank of 16 East Providence, Rhode Island, also, who was accused of stabbing Antonio Cardozo, 17, to death Sunday at the North Attleboro apartment, is driven from North Attleboro Police Headquarters to Attleboro District Court in a cruiser this morning uh, at the left. Police escort, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't redact this name, um, uh, of, of Providence, from the station this morning, uh, Blank, who was attending North Attleboro High School under a false address, is charged with being an accessory after the murder. The two were arrested Monday afternoon, the police headquarters, and were held overnight without bail. Police said there were signs of drug use in the apartment, and they believe the stabbing came in and about a fight over cocaine. So I'm not going to really read through all of these articles, but I just wanted to kind of touch on the information that was put out there. Um, and you can see here the two police officers, state police officers, bag pieces of evidence in the murder investigation in Route 1 parking lot in North Attleboro. And you got to remember, this is January, and you can see here there's snow on the ground. Um, so it just goes on to talk about, um, you know, what happened, you know, what they they the evidence is saying at this point and basically just kind of the first information they gave in the uh the first article that i showed this uh this was in 1994. yeah we were 17 years old you know i was 16 at the time um so we go into now victims victims sought new life tony wanted out and this is where i you know kind of talked about that um antonio tony cardoza ex experimented with drugs but he was trying to set his life straight several of his friends said tuesday all kids experience drugs but tony wanted out 
He wanted a better life. Given more time and love, he could have a chance at a better life, said Angela. I'm not going to say the last names. Cardoza, 17, was stabbed at his mother's apartment on Sunday night and died at Sturdy Memorial Hospital. Multiple wounds. The funeral will be on Friday. Cardoza was trying to resist pressure by his friends to continue using drugs, including Sunday night when he was allegedly stabbed by a friend, they said. 16, uh, blank 16 of the Rumford section of East Providence was arraigned Tuesday in Attleboro Juvenile Court in charges of first degree murder. So that is, uh, that's one of the, uh, the suspects there. And uh, suspects held on a $100,000 bail. And you can see one of the suspect's mothers here in court um, after the fatal stabbing. I I'm not going to read all of the articles. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a brief of, um, you know, this story. So um, just some more news articles here. Frem's Friends blamed in North Attleboro murder just kind of goes on. Now we have a little bit more of the background of the story of what was going on during that time. And, um, you know, as the investigation went on, more information started to get out. <clears throat> I remember in this article, um, they. I'm going to read this excerpt really quick. Um. Blank of Providence faces murder charges in Attleboro Juvenile Court in the stabbing death of Antonio Tony Cardoza, 17, of North Attleboro. Blank, who was originally charged with being an accessory, was later indicted for murder, and he pled innocent. The stabbing occurred in the kitchen of Cardoza's mother's house in the apartment of the Meadows apartment off Route 1. Cardoza died um, at Sturdy Memorial Hospital from, from multiple stab wounds. When questioned by police initially, they said a man named Beaver stabbed Cardoso, but later changed his story when they told there was security cameras in the apartment building. Really? Security cameras back then? It's like 94. Wow, that's crazy. You wouldn't even think that. Um, Blank then blamed his friend Blank of East Providence and told people they agreed. So basically, they, when they got the two suspects together, you know, one started piddling, you know, turning on the other and so on. You know, they wanted to distance themselves as far as they could from this, obviously, this this crime. Um, right here, it says, showing the evidence, Adabur superintendent, uh, this is not a related picture, I'm sorry, but it goes on to say, um, this is really crazy too. Um, uh, it's going to go on to just talk a little bit more about um, both men were, were 16 at the time of the murder. Police told the stabbing occurred when uh, Blank and Cardozo started fighting in the kitchen after snorting cocaine, O'Reilly testified. Uh, so right now, the trial had been in court at this time. Uh, he heard a fight, O'Reilly testified, and then he heard Tony yelling, no, no. After the struggle, O'Reilly said Cardozo ran out of the apartment uh, through the back door. Blank told the police he and Blank fled out of the front door, O'Reilly said. The police officer said... Um, found a mirror with white powder believed to be cocaine and a straw used to snort cocaine in the apartment. Later, Blank uh, showed police where he said Blank threw the knife and used, they used to stab Cardoso. He said he told uh, police, they telephoned him making sure that um, the same story, they had this, you know, their story straight, basically. Uh, it's going to go on to say there's no physical evidence. You know, you got to think this is 94 uh, DNA evidence is just being brought into court cases at the time. And it's, you're going to see something here in the article, which is crazy because uh, at this time, I don't want to spoil it yet, but when we get down, you'll see a particular uh, case that was making a lot of headlines at the time. Um, but, you know, really at the cusp of, of DNA um, at that time. So, um, and then we, we, get to two, you know, almost two years out, Thursday, January 25th, 1996. And actually, I want to go back up really quick. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to show. And here we are, 1996. So, I mean, really, at this time, the only news that we're getting, 
you know, it's not like the internet, how everything is so quick now, uh, you know, at the touch of everything and the, the, the information cycle is going and going and going, you know, you, you think my life has been separated now. I'm not with any of those people anymore. I'm not hanging out with any of those people. I haven't talked to his mom since all of this happened. The friends that we all are have all dispersed. So the information that you're only getting is through, uh, you know, old fashioned, you know, newspaper articles, you know, so uh, that's. That's what you got. Suspect acquitted in murder. Lack of testimony Testimony from killer sinks North case. I'm just trying to get to... So, um, blank, blank, accused of stabbing death of North Attabur teenager found innocent of murder Wednesday after a three-day bench trial in Attabur Juvenile Court. They walked. One of them walked. Delinquent to be an accessory after the fact, the finding is I'm uh, inequitable guilty to finding uh, in an adult court. The case would be tried in juvenile court, was 16 at the time in January 30th, 1994, killing Antonio Tony Cardoza. Um, appealing the delinquent finding in the accessory charge to a six member jury and is free on bail. He declined to comment on the judge's decision. Blank sat between his sister and mother. All cried softly when lawsuit issued a very uh, the verdict. Afterwards, the mother said she was very very relieved. That's ridiculous. No, one of them didn't get convicted. Lee, they walked. You got to think. Investigating back then was a lot different. There's no DNA really being used. They only had the two to cooperate their stories or go against each other. Um, I know in one of the earlier articles, they would not testify against each other. Um, and from what I remember, one of them got eight years and the other guy walked. Um, so this is interesting. If you look to the right hand of the article, look what's up there. It says Simpson, and that is the OJ Simpson trial because that was going on at this time. And I just found that really interesting when I was looking this over. Um, the, pro the prosecution contended that Blank and his friend, who were also 16 at the time, so these guys are now 18 because two years have gone by. Um, they ultimately admitted to the, being involved. Um, and then basically what happened was there was a lack of uh, preparedness by the prosecution and that ended up um, ending in a mistrial. So there was no there was no justice um, in my friend's death. And this is the last article that was ever printed about it. So a mistrial to end North Attleboro death case, accused accessory to be freed because of delays. The defendant charged with being an accessory in the murder of North Attleboro teenager two years left the courthouse Friday, assured he can no longer be prosecuted for this crime. Blank of Providence no longer is prosecuted because the failure of the district attorney's office to get the trial completed before the 19th birthday and because the quarks in the juvenile law, which required in the case two trials. This is what happens when you have very, very liberal laws and when you live in very very liberal states people walk people get off so there was no um there was no justice the co-defendant blank who was 16 at the time pled guilty so what he had done one of the co-defendants what he had done was the prosecution frightened him enough where the other guy kind of rolled the dice. Um, so basically he pled guilty to um, second degree murder. 
he got a 15 year sentence and I believe he only served eight. The one that got off, and if I go back, if you watch the beginning of the show, the gentleman in the middle of the picture here went after him and beat the shit out of him pretty bad. And um, was so torn up about it, he ended up trying to commit suicide. He made it, and uh, it's been many, 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 many years since I've seen him. So this, it's just a, a crazy cycle of weirdness and 90s law and, you know, just crazy stuff. So, uh, yeah, and this is uh, Saturday, March 9th of 1996. My birthday is on March 17th. So we got this news uh, in 96. Defendant free in North Attleboro case. And that's it. My friend got no justice. Um, let me pull some of these chats up. Sorry, guys. Um, Lee says, uh, so young. What year? It was 94. And he didn't get convicted. One co-defendant walked. The other one, I believe, I remember, got eight years. Because he made a deal with the prosecution right away. And just went through the process. Chris Pepper says, so sad. Lee says, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. And uh, yep, we've kind of went over that. I wonder what became of the suspect. Um, Lee says, oh, wow. And then Chris says, eight years for killing someone. That's just not right at all. I completely agree. So sadly, um, Tony's mom passed away, I believe, three or four years ago from a battle with stomach cancer. Um, I unfortunately did not get to see her because so many years had gone by, but I know a very close mutual friend of mine did get to see her uh, a couple of months up before she passed away. And it's just tragic all around that I look at the whole situation where you have an individual, um, I guess I just kind of look at this as in an adult way now and just really the reality of the situation. You had an, an individual that was plucked from a very problematic area. Well, not plucked, but had a, an opportunity out of a very prob prob problematic area. Got in with a very good home and just could never really adjust to that life. And just something about that crime life or just being around kids that have issues or it's just such different times back then. You know, kids were fighting and it was crime and there's drugs and... um just could never pull himself away from those people. And I don't know, maybe he was just overprotective of me to keep me away from it. You know, these are just things that I think about over the years. Um, I've only been to, to visit his grave once. Uh, it's just very emotional. And, uh, you know, real quick, just before... Um, Lee says, oh, she, yeah, she's, yes, you know, they're, they're together. They're in heaven now. Really quick, just to kind of sum up the story and, and kind of end, I, I, I kind of hate saying this, you know, ending the stream, I guess on a, I wouldn't say positive, but um, I guess a, 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 a sense of being, if I want to say that. Somewhere in early 2000, I think 2002, 2003, 2004, right around, ironically, around his birthday, um, I sat on my bed and I had this kind of, I didn't really speak or talk out, but I just said, maybe in my head or something like, I wonder how Tony's doing. I wonder how you're doing, bud. And I swear, all of a sudden, I felt his presence kind of come into the room. And I had this just overwhelm of calm, this calming moment, like, I'm okay. I'm good. And I think that was 
that was good because it kind of gave me a sense of peace for him because I never really had those uh, questions answered. But I did. I had this kind of overfilling feeling of his presence. And he just kind of gave me like, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm okay. And I kind of just smiled, you know, and I definitely knew he was there. So I, I believe in in paranormal and stuff like that and, and energy. And he definitely, definitely showed up to kind of calm me and just say, hey, bud, I'm all right, you know. So it's uh, – Kristen says – Gangs were huge in the 90s and affected young people, even if they were not, not involved. I remember going up to our local mall and how scary it was on like a Friday, Saturday night to even just walk through there because people were just looking to pick fights or just looking to like fight you or uh, steal your, you know, we wore starter, starter jackets and Raiders caps and they just try to like steal anything from you, your hat, your jacket, your shoes. I mean, it was crazy. Lee said it started in the 80s with crack too absolutely Kristen's agreeing um, Teresa's just asked, answering Chris the laws for juveniles are very difficult from a uh, very the laws the law for juveniles are very different from adults but that uh, was so that was not a long sentence absolutely and then Lee says uh, go to his grave and plant tulips for Ethan's smile a suggestion uh, for a reason to visit his grave. I think I'm going to do that. I have a week coming up off from work and I'm going to be streaming a lot actually during that, but I think I'm going to take that time and I will take that suggestion and go do that. So thank you for that, Lee. I appreciate that. And Kristen says, my starter Hoyer's jacket got stolen at gunpoint. It's nuts. Yeah. Those starter jackets were huge, man. Uh, I don't know. Let me, let me, um, I don't know if, if you guys were in the chat earlier, but I'll pull up that picture again. Hang on. And then um, let me pull this up again. That's a great photo. God, I miss him so much. Yeah, look at this. I don't know if you saw this, Kristen. So that's me. This is 91. It's me to the left. Gentleman in the middle, and then my friend Tony's in white, and <laughs> un the uh, unsuspected female got uh, scratched out in the photo. It was probably an ex girlfriend or something like that of Tony, troublemaker. <laughs> but look at us in our Raiders gear. We had the MC Hammer pants on. But a very, um, you know, look at me. I, I, you know, we're almost close to the same age here. He was just a very big physical kid, you know, uh, and just someone that uh, was a protector. You know, he protected me. These guys protected me. And I get the look at the Everlast. I don't know what hat I'm wearing though. It was always Raiders for us. Oh my God, we were all Raiders. Everything was Raiders colors: silver, black, the silver and black. Always Raiders colors. But yeah, those were good times. It's good to go back. I like what's on the door. Welcome, friends. I don't even remember where this was. Oh, this is Tony's house. That's the front door. Okay, yeah. So th that would be someone took that picture from standing. He had a, you know, like a sun porch you would walk into, and these were the the doors that the door that would open, and that door to the left would go down to his like cellar, and the door I think right to the right was a bathroom, if I remember. But yeah. <laughs> Lee says, look at you. She says, I believe in the paranormal too. That it could have been us. Yes. That could have been us. So uh, not a super long stream tonight. I just wanted to pop on and kind of share a personal experience because listen, I've been through it. I know, um, you know, we've, we've been following a lot of the, the Idaho uh, case here, Brian Koberger. I, I know what those families are going through. Um, you know, fortunately today, in today's world, there's a lot more of grief counseling and support systems. You know, we didn't have a lot of that back then. So I think the easiest way I think back then was to really just suppress a lot of that emotion and try to, you know, I hate to say this, but move past it very quickly. Um, but, you know, as an adult, I've been able to go back and kind of go back and, and grieve a little bit more and, and kind of sort through those feelings and 
Um, it's just, like I said, it's tragic. It's tragic all around and uh, it shouldn't have happened. And uh, unfortunately, you know, there was just no justice in, in the whole, the whole thing. That's, that's what really sucks out of all of it. Um, so my friends, that is going to end the stream for this evening. Thursday night is going to be an amazing show. Please come over and join us for the drunk turkeys. We will be here. We're going to talk Idaho. We're going to talk Brian Koberger. I have an amazing show lined up with those guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I hope to see all of your smiling faces there. Um, set your reminders. It's going to be at 830 Thursday night, um, March. What's the date on that? March 9th. I already have the reminder up. You can go over and just click the remind me button on my main page. And um, I hope that I see all of you there. So thank you so much for joining the stream and hanging out this evening. Um, let me just pull this up real quick. SC says, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much for being here, SC. Um, Lee says, that's true. More help, still hard. And she says, Kristen saying, you did good, uh, Opie. Opie, they call me Opie. Loss is a loss no matter how time, how much time passes. Be thankful uh, you are someone who can still have attachment uh, to the past. And Lee says, and you are honored. You honored Tony tonight. Uh, we know who he is. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So, um, <laughs> um, I appreciate everybody hanging in this evening and uh, watching the show. And um, I will see you all on Thursday night. This one was tonight. This, this one was for you, Tony. All right, guys. Have a good night.